Hello class and welcome to this week. This week we're going to be taking a look at sensation and perception. So the ability to detect and interpret events that occur around us allow us to respond to these stimuli appropriately. Now in most cases the system is successful, but as I've already mentioned in the week's introduction, it's not perfect. And so this week we're going to explore and discuss the strengths and limitations of the capacities of sensation and perception. And we're going to focus on both sensations, that is the awareness resulting from the stimulation of a sense organ, and perception, the organization and interpretation of those sensations. Sensation and perception work seamlessly together to allow us to experience the world through our eyes, our ears, our nose, tongue, and skin, but also to combine what we are currently learning from the environment with what we already know about it, and to make judgments and to choose appropriate behaviors. The study of sensation and perception is exceedingly important for our everyday lives because the knowledge generated by psychologists is used in so many ways to help so many people. Psychologists work closely with mechanical and electrical engineers, with experts in defense and military contractors, and with clinical health and sports psychologists to help them to apply all of this knowledge to their everyday practices. And the research is used to help understand and better prepare people to cope with such diverse events as driving cars, flying airplanes, creating robots, and managing pain, and to improve the safety of our lives, as well as the ease and convenience that we experience in our everyday life. Now, as we look at this week, we're going to focus on those six senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting, and the monitoring of your body's positions, proprioception. And what we'll see here is that sensation is relative, sometimes relatively direct in the sense that the wide variety of stimuli around us inform and guide our behaviors very quickly and very accurately, but nevertheless is always the result of at least some interpretation. We do not directly experience stimuli, but rather we experience those stimuli, stimuli as they are created by our senses. Each sense accomplishes the basic process of transduction, the conversion of stimuli detected by receptor cells to electrical impulses that are then transported to the brain in different but in related ways. And after we review the basic processes of sensation, we're going to turn the topic to perception and focus on how the brain's processing of sensory experience can not only help us make quick and accurate judgments, but also can sometimes mislead us into making perceptual and judgment errors. Just like that chaser group was able to breach the security at the APEC meeting that I discussed earlier. So. What is it that we experience and what are sensory thresholds? Well, humans possess some powerful sensory capacities that allow us to sense a kaleidoscope of sights and sounds and smells and tastes that surround us. And our eyes detect light energy and our ears pick up sound waves. Our skin senses touch, pressure, heat and cold. Our tongue reacts to the molecules of the food we eat, and our noses detect scents in the air. The human perceptual system is wired for accuracy, and people are exceedingly good at making use of the wide variety of information available to them. In many ways, our senses are quite remarkable. The human eye, for example, can detect the equivalent of a single candle flame burning 
50 kilometers away and can distinguish between more than 300,000 different colors. The human ear can detect sounds as low as 20 hertz, that's 20 vibrations per second, and as high as 20,000 hertz. And it can hear the tick of a clock from five meters away in a quiet room. You can taste a teaspoon of sugar dissolved in two gallons of water. And we're able to smell only one drop of perfume in a three bedroom apartment. We can feel the wing of a bee on our cheek dropped from one centimeter above. And all of this gives us a sense that we are incredibly sensitive beings to our environment. And although there is so much we do sense, there's even more that we are totally unaware of. For example, dogs and bats and whales and some rodents are all better at hearing than we are. And many animals have a far richer sense of smell. Birds are able to see the ultraviolet light that we cannot see and can also sense the pull of the Earth's magnetic field. Cats have an extremely sensitive and sophisticated sense of touch and they are able to navigate in complete darkness using just their whiskers. And the fact that different organisms have different sensations is part of their evolutionary adaptation. Each species is adapted to sensing the things that are most important to them, whilst being blissfully unaware of the things that don't matter. Now, how do we measure sensation? Well, psychophysics is the branch of psychology that studies the effect of physical stimuli on sensory perceptions and mental states. The field of psychophysics was founded by the German psychologist Gustav Fechner, who lived from 1801 to 1887. He was the first to study the relationship between the strength of a stimuli and a person's ability to detect the stimuli. The measurement technique developed by Fechner and his colleagues are designed in part to help determine the limits of human sensation. One important criteria is the ability to detect very faint stimuli. The absolute threshold of a sensation is defined as the intensity of a stimulus that allows an organism to just barely detect it. In a typical psychophysics experiment, an individual is presented with a series of trials in which a signal is sometimes presented and sometimes not, or in which two stimuli are presented that are either the same or different. Imagine, for instance, that you were asked to take a hearing test. On each of the trials, your task is to indicate whether either yes, if you heard a sound, or no, if you didn't. Their signals are purposefully made to be very faint, making accurate judgments difficult. The problem for you is that the very faint signals create uncertainty because their ears are constantly sending background information to the brain. You will sometimes think that you heard a sound when none was there, and you will sometimes fail to detect a sound that is there. Your task is to determine whether the neural activity that you are experiencing is due to the background noise alone or a result of a signal within the noise. The response that you give on the hearing test can be analyzed using signal detection analysis. And what signal detection analysis is, is a technique used to determine the ability of the perceiver to separate true signals from background noise. And sometimes when looking for the outcomes of signal detection analysis, each judgment trial creates four possible outcomes. A hit occurs when, when you, as the listener, correctly say yes, 
when there was a sound. A false alarm occurs when you respond yes to no signals. In the other two cases, you respond no either a miss, saying no when there was a signal, or correct rejection, saying no when there was in fact no signal. Now, our ability to accurately detect stimuli is measured using a signal detection analysis. Two of the possible decisions, hits and correct rejections, are accurate. And the other two, misses and false alarms, are errors. The analysis of the data from a psychophysics experiment creates two measures. One measure, known as sensitivity, refers to the true ability of the individual to detect the presence or absence of signals. Now, people who have better hearing will have higher sensitivity than will those with poorer hearing. The other measure, response bias, refers to a behavioral tendency to respond yes to the trials, which is independent of sensitivity. Now imagine, for instance, that rather than taking a hearing test, you are a soldier on guard duty and your job is to detect the very faint sound of the breaking of a branch that indicates that an enemy is nearby. You can see that in this case, making a false alarm by alerting the other soldiers to the sound might not be as costly as a miss, a failure to report the sound, which could be deadly. Therefore, you might well adopt a very lenient response bias in which whenever you are at all unsure, you send a warning signal. In this case, your response may not be very accurate, your sensitivity may be low because you are making a lot of false alarms, and yet the extreme response bias can save lives. Another application of signal detection occurs when medical technicians study body images for the presence of cancerous tumors. Again, a miss, in which the technician incorrectly determines there is no tumor, can be very costly. But false alarms, referring patients who do not have tumors for further testing, also has costs. The ultimate decisions that the de technician make are based on the quality of the signal, the clarity of the image their experience and their training, their ability to recognize certain shapes and textures of tumors, and their best guesses about the relative costs of misses versus false alarms. Now, although we have focused a lot at this point on the absolute threshold, the second important criterion concerns the ability to assess differences between stimuli and that is the difference threshold, or the just noticeable difference. And this refers to the change in a stimulus that can just barely be detected by an organism. And the German physiologist Ernst Weber, from 1795 to 1878, made an important discovery about the just noticeable difference, namely that the ability to detect differences depends not so much on the size of the difference, but on the size of the difference in relationship to the absolute size of the stimulus. And this is known as Weber's Law. And Weber's Law maintains that the just noticeable difference of a stimulus is a constant proportion of the original intensity of the stimulus. As an example, if you have a cup of coffee that is only a very little bit of sugar in it, say one teaspoon, adding another teaspoon of sugar will make a big difference in the taste. But if you added that same teaspoon to a cup of coffee that already has five teaspoons of sugar in it, then you probably won't taste the difference, at least not as much. In fact, according to Weber's law, you would have to add five more teaspoons to make the same difference in taste. Now, one interesting application of Weber's law is in our everyday shopping behavior. Our tendency to perceive cost differences between products is really dependent not only on the amount of money we will spend or save, but also on the amount of money saved relative to the price of the purchase. Now, I'd venture to say that if you were to go out and buy 
a drink or a candy bar in a convenience store and the price of the items ranged from a dollar to three dollars you would think that the three dollar item cost a lot more than the one dollar item but now imagine if you were comparing two music systems one that cost three ninety seven and one that cost three ninety nine probably you would think that the cost of the two systems were about the same even though buying the cheaper one would still save you that two dollars now there's been a lot of research that is focused on the influence without awareness and we can think of that in terms of absolute threshold when we see that the absolute threshold is the point where we are aware of a faint stimulus after that point we say that the stimulus is conscious because we can accurately report on its existence or its non-existence better than 50 percent of the time but can subliminal stimuli events that occur below the absolute threshold and of which we are not conscious have an influence on our behavior well it does seem that that is indeed the case as the intensity of stimulus increases we are more likely to perceive it stimuli below the absolute threshold can still have at least some influence on us even though we cannot consciously detect them and a variety of research programs have found that subliminal stimuli can influence our judgments and our behavior at least in the short term but whether the presentation of subliminal stimuli can influence the products that we buy has been a more controversial topic in psychology. In one relevant experiment, some Dutch students reviewed a series of computer trials in which there's a string of letters such as BBBBBBB or uppercase BBB, lowercase b, and then uppercase BBBBB, and those were presented on the screen. To be sure they paid attention to the display, the students were asked to note whether the string contains a small b. However, immediately before each of the letter strings, the researchers presented either the name of a drink that was popular, Lipton iced tea, or a control string containing the same letters as Lipton ice, but not spelling Lipton ice like N-P-E-I-C-T-O-L. These words were presented so quick for only about one fiftieth of a second that the participants could not see them. And then the students were asked to indicate their intention to drink Lipton ice by answering questions such as, if you were to sit on a terrace now, would, how likely is it that you would order Lipton ice? and also to indicate how thirsty they were at that time. Researchers found that the students who were exposed to the Lipton ice words, and particularly those who indicated that they were already thirsty, were significantly more likely to say that they would drink Lipton ice than were those who had been exposed to the control words. Now, if it were effective, procedures such as this, and we can call the technique subliminal advertising, because it advertises a product outside awareness, would have some major advantages for advertisers, because it would allow them to promote their products without directly interrupting the customer's activities and without the consumers knowing that they were being persuaded. Now people can counter argue with or attempt to avoid being influenced by messages received outside of awareness and due to fears that people may be influenced without their knowledge subliminal advertising has been legally banned in many countries including countries like Australia, Great Britain and the United States. And although it has been proven to work in some research, subliminal advertising effectiveness is really still uncertain. But all of this taken together does suggest the evidence for the effectiveness of subliminal advertising is weak, but does seem to be some kind of phenomenon. Now, you probably don't have to worry too much about being subliminally sub persuaded in your 
everyday life, even if subliminal ads were allowed in your country. But even if subliminal advertising is not at all effective itself, there are plenty of other indirect advertising techniques that are used that do work. For instance, many ads for automobiles and alcohol beverages are subtly sexualized, which encourages the consumer to indirectly, even if not subliminally, associate their, these products with sexuality. And there is even more frequent product placement techniques where images of brands, so cars, drinks, electronics, and so forth, are placed on websites and in popular television shows and movies. And some researchers have found that being exposed to food advertising on television significantly increased child and adult snacking behaviors. Again, suggesting that the effects of perceived images, even if presented above the absolute threshold, may nevertheless be very subtle. Now, another example of processing that occurs outside of our awareness is seen when certain areas of the visual cortex are damaged, and this is called something called blind sight, a condition in which people are unable to consciously report a visual stimuli, but nevertheless are able to accurately answer questions about what they are seeing. When people with blind sight are asked directly what stimuli look like, or to determine whether these stimuli are present at all, they cannot do so at better than chance level. They report that they cannot see anything, really. However, when they are asked more indirect questions, they are able to give correct answers. For example, people with blind sight are able to correctly determine an object's location and direction of movement as well as identify simple geometric forms and patterns. It seems that although conscious reports of the visual experiences are not possible, there is still a parallel and implicit process at work, enabling the person to perceive certain aspects of that stimuli. Now, let's take a look at seeing. So, whereas other animals rely primarily on hearing, smell, or touch to understand the world around them, human beings rely in large part on vision. A large part of our cerebral cortex is devoted to seeing, and we have substantial visual skills. Seeing begins when light falls on the eye, initiating the process of transduction. Once this visual information reaches the visual cortex, the occipital lobe, it is processed by a variety of neurons that detect colors, shapes, and motion, and that create meaningful perceptions out of the incoming stimuli. The air around us is filled with a sea of electromagnetic energy, pulses of energy waves that can carry information from place to place. And these electromagnetic waves vary in their wavelength, the distance between one wave peak and the next wave peak, with the shortest gamma waves being only a fraction of a millimeter in length, and the longest radio waves being hundreds of kilometers long. Humans are blind to almost all of this energy, but our eyes detect only a range from about 400 to 700 billionths of a meter the part of the electromagnetic spectrum known as the visible spectrum. And only a small fraction of the electromagnetic energy that surrounds us, the visual spectrum, is detectable by the human eye. Now, the sensing eye and the perceiving visual cortex work in tandem for us to experience sight. So light enters the eye through the cornea, a clear covering that protects the eye and begins to focus the incoming light. The light then passes through the pupil, a small opening at the center of the eye, and the pupil is surrounded by the iris, the colored part of the eye that controls the size of the pupil by constricting or dilating in response to light intensity. When we enter a dark movie theater on a sunny day, for instance, muscles in the uh, iris open the pupil and allow more light to enter. 
complete adaptation to the dark, though, may take up to 20 minutes. Uh, behind the pupil is the lens, a structure that focuses the incoming light on the retina. The layer of tissue at the back of the eye that contains the photoreceptor cells. As our eyes move from near objects to distant objects, a process known as visual accommodation occurs. And visual accommodation is the process of changing the curvature of the lens to keep the light entering the eye focused on the retina. And rays from the top of the image strike the bottom of the retina and vice versa. And the rays from the left side of the image strike the right side of the retina and vice versa, causing the image on the retina to be upside down and backward. And furthermore, the image projected on the retina is flat. And yet, our final perception of the image will be three-dimensional. And light enters the eye through the, that transparent cornea and passing through the pupil at the center of the iris. The lens adjusts to refocus the light on the retina, where it appears upside down and backward. And receptor cells on the retina send information via the optic nerve to the visual cortex. An accommodation is not always perfect, and in some cases the light there is hitting the retina is a bit out of focus, and that's where you experience things like nearsightedness or farsightedness. If the focus is in the front of the retina, we say that the person is nearsighted, and when the focus is behind the retina, we say the person is farsighted. And this is where eyeglasses and contact lenses correct this problem by adding another lens in front of the eye, and laser eye surgery corrects the problem by reshaping the eye's own lens. Now, for people with normal vision, the lens properly focuses incoming light on the retina. For people who are nearsighted, images for far objects focus too far in front of the retina, whereas for people with, who are farsighted, images from near objects focus too far from the retina. And so eyeglasses solve the problem by adding that secondary corrective lens. And the retina contains layers of neurons specialized to respond to light. As light falls on the retina, it first activates receptor cells known as rods and cones. The activation of these cells then spreads to the bipolar cells and then to the ganglion cells, which gather together and converge like a strand of rope forming the optic nerve. The optic nerve is a collection of millions of ganglion neurons that sends vast amounts of visual information. It first goes to the thalamus, then it's recognized as visual information, and then it is sent off to the occipital lobe of the brain to be processed. Because the retina and the optic nerve are active processes and analyzes of visual information, it is not inappropriate to think of these structures as an extension of the brain itself. So when light falls on the retina, it creates a photochemical reaction in the rods and cones at the back of the retina. And the reactions that continue to the bipolar cell, the ganglion cells, and eventually to the optic nerve. Now the rods are visual neurons that specialize in detecting black, white, and gray colors. Uh, there are about 120 million rods in each eye. And the rods do not provide a lot of detail about the images we see, but because they are highly sensitive to shorter wave that is darker and weak light, they help us to see in dim light, for instance, at night. Because the rods are located primarily around the edges of the retina, they are particularly active in peripheral vision. When we need to see something at night, try looking out away from what you want to see, and it will likely help you to see a little bit better. And the cones, then, are the visual neurons that are specialized in detecting fine detail and colors. The five million or so cones in each eye enable us to see in color, but they operate best in bright light. The cones are located primarily in or around the fovea, which is the central point of the retina. 
Now, to, to demonstrate the difference between rods and cones in attention to detail, choose a word that you're looking at and focus on it. Now, do you notice that the words a few inches to the side become more blurry? That gives you a little bit of a sense of the difference between rods and cones. Now, Margaret Livingston found an interesting effect that demonstrates the different processing capabilities of the eyes, rods, and cones. Namely, that the Mona Lisa smile, which is widely revered as elusive, is perceived differently depending upon how one looks at the painting. Because Leonardo da Vinci painted the smile in low detail brush strokes, these details are better perceived by our peripheral vision, that is the rods, than by the cones. Now Livingston found that people rated the Mona Lisa to be more cheerful when they were instructed to focus on her eyes than they did when they were asked to look directly at her mouth. As Livingston put it, she smiles until you look at her mouth, and then it fades, like a dim star that disappears when you look directly at it. Now, as you might be able to tell, the sensory information received by the retina is relayed through the thalamus to corresponding areas of the visual cortex, which is located in the occipital lobe at the back of the brain. So although the principle of contralateral control might lead you to expect that the left eye would send information to the right brain hemisphere and vice versa, nature's smarter than that. In fact, the left and right eyes each send information to both the left and right hemisphere. And the visual cortex processes each of the cues separately, but in parallel. And this is an adaptation advantage to the organism that loses sight in one eye, because even if only one eye is functional, both hemispheres will still receive input from it. And the left and right eyes each send information to both the left and right brain hemisphere. And the visual cortex is made up of specialized neurons that turn the sensations they receive from the optic nerve into meaningful images. Because there are no photoreceptor cells at the place where the optic nerve leaves the retina, there's a hole or blind spot in our vision that is created by that gap. When both of our eyes are open, we don't experience a problem because our eyes are constantly moving and one eye makes up for what the other eye misses. But the visual system is also designed to deal with this problem if only one eye is open. The visual cortex simply fills in the small hole in our vision with similar patterns from the surrounding areas. And we never therefore notice the difference. So the ability of the visual system to cope with the blind spot is another example of how sensation and perception work together to create meaningful experience. Now you get the idea that the extent of our blind spot, the place where the optic nerve leaves the retina by trying a little demonstration and you can experience this a little bit. So close your left eye and stare with your right eye at the cross in the diagram. You should be able to see the elephant image on the right. Now don't look at it, but just notice that it is there. Now if you can't see the elephant, move closer and or farther away until you can. Now slowly move so that you are closer to the image while you keep looking at the cross. At one distance, the elephant will probably completely disappear from your view because its image has fallen on the blind spot. So perception is created in part through the simultaneous action of thousands of feature detector neurons. And these are specialized neurons located in the visual cortex that respond to the strength, the angles, the shapes, the edges, and movements of a visual stimulus. 
Now the feature detectors work in parallel, each performing a specialized function. When faced with a red square, for instance, the parallel line feature detectors, the horizontal line feature detectors, and the red color feature detectors all become activated. And this activation is then passed on to other parts of the visual cortex where other neurons compare the information supplied by the feature detectors with images stored in memory. Suddenly, in a flash of recognition, the many neurons fire together, creating the single image of a red square that we might experience. And the Necker cube is an example of how the visual system creates perceptions out of sensations. We do not see a series of lines, but rather a cube. Which cube we see varies depending on the momentary outcome of perception processes in the visual cortex. Some feature detectors are tuned to selectively respond to particularly important objects, for instance, faces, smiles, and other parts of the body. When researchers disrupted face recognition areas of the cortex using the magnetic pulses of transcranial magnetic stimulation, people were temporarily unable to recognize faces, and yet they were still able to recognize houses. Then there's perceiving color. Now it's been estimated that the visual, human visual system can detect and discriminate about 7 million color variations. But these variations are all created by the combinations of the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. The shade of a color, known as a hue, is conveyed by the wavelength of the light that enters the eye. We see shorter wavelengths as more blue and longer wavelengths as more red. And we detect brightness from the intensity or height of the wave. Bigger or more intense waves are perceived as brighter. Now light waves with short frequencies or shorter frequencies are perceived as more blue than red. Light waves with higher intensity are seen as brighter. Now, in an important research study on color vision, Hermann von Helmholtz, who lived from 1821 to 1894, theorized that color is perceived because the cones in the retina come in three types. One type of cone reacts primarily to blue light, that is short wavelengths. Another reacts primarily to green light, medium wavelengths. And a third reacts primarily to red light, long wavelengths. The visual cortex then detects and compares the strength of the signals from each of the three types of cones, creating the experience of color. Now, according to this young Helmholtz trichromatic color theory, what color we see depends on the mix of signals from the three types of cones. If the brain is receiving primarily red and blue signals, for instance, it will perceive purple. If it is re receiving primarily red and green signals, it will perceive yellow. And if it is receiving messages from all three types of cones, it will perceive white. The different functions of the different types of cones are apparent in people who have color blindness. That is the inability to detect either green and or red color. Now about one in 50 people, most likely men, lack functioning in the red green sensitive cones, leaving them only able to perceive either one or two color. Now people with normal color vision can see the number 42 in the first image and the number 12 in the second image. They're vague, but they are apparent. However, people who are colorblind cannot see the numbers at all. And the trichromatic color theory cannot explain all of human vision, but it does give us a good sense of how a lot of it works. However, for one, although the color purple does appear to us as a mixing of red and blue, yellow does not appear to be a mix of red and green. 
and people with color blindness who cannot see either green or red nevertheless can still see yellow. An alternative approach, therefore, to the young Helmholtz theory, known as the opponent process color theory, proposes that we analyze sensory information not in terms of three colors, but rather in three sets of opponent colors, red, green, yellow, blue, and white, black. Now, evidence for the opponent process theory comes from the fact that some neurons in the retina and in the visual cortex are excited by one color, for example, red, but inhibited by another color, such as green. Now, one example of the opponent processing occurs in the experience of an after image. If you stare at the flag on the image here for about 30 seconds, and the longer you look, the better your effect will be. And then you move your eyes to a blank area or move your eyes and look up at the ceiling, at the white of the ceiling, you will see an after image. And when you stare at the green stripes, our green receptors habituate and begin to process less strongly, whereas the red receptors remain at full strength. When we switch our gaze, we see primarily the red part of the opponent process. And similar processes create blue after yellow and white after black. And the presence of an after image is best explained by that opponent process theory of color perception. Now you stare at the flag for a few seconds and then you move your gaze to the blank space and you see that after image. The tricolor and the opponent process mechanisms work together to produce color vision. And when light rays enter the eye, the red, blue, and green cones on the eye respond in different degrees and send different strength signals of red, blue, and green through that optic nerve. And the color signals are then processed by both the ganglion cells and by the neurons in the cortex. And one of the important processes required in vision is the perception of form. German psychologists in the 1930s and 1940s, including uh, Max Wertheimer and Kurt Kafka and Wolfgang Kohler, argued that we create forms out of their component sensations based on the idea of Gestalt, a meaningful organized whole. And the idea of the Gestalt is that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And there are many different demonstrations of Gestalt perceptions in form perceptions that can take place. Then there's perceiving of depth. And depth perception is the ability to perceive three-dimensional space and to accurately judge distance. Without depth perception, we would be unable to drive a car, for example, or to thread a needle, or simply navigate around in the supermarket. And researchers found that depth perception is in part based on the innate capacity and in part learned through experiences. Now, psychologist Eleanor Gibson and her associate Richard Walk back in the 1960s, tested the ability to perceive depth in six to 14 month old infants by placing them on a, what is called a visual cliff, a mechanism that gives the perception of a dangerous drop off in which infants can be safely tested for their perception of depth. And the infants are placed on one side of the cliff while their mothers call to them from the other side. And Gibson and Walk found that most infants either crawled away from the cliff or remained on the board and cried because they wanted to go to their mothers, but the infants perceived a chasm that they instinctively could not cross. And further research has found that even very young children who cannot yet crawl are fearful of heights. On the other hand, studies have also found that infants 
improve their hand-eye coordination as they learn to better grasp objects and as they gain more experience in crawling, indicating that depth perception is also learned. And depth perception is also the ability of our use of depth cues. Those are messages from our bodies and the external environment that supply us with information about space and distance. And there are binocular depth cues, and those are depth cues that are created by retinal image disparity, that is, the space between our eyes, and thus which require the coordination of both eyes. Now one outcome of retinal disparity is that the images projected on each eye are slightly different from each other. The visual cortex automatically merges the two images into one, enabling us to perceive depth. Three-dimensional movies make use of retinal disparity by using 3D glasses that the viewer wears to create a different image on each eye. The perceptual system quickly and easily and unconsciously turns the disparity into three dimensions. Uh, now an important binocular depth cue is convergence, the inward turning of our eyes that is required to focus on objects that are less than 50 feet away from us. The visual cortex uses the size of the convergence angle between the eyes to judge the object's distance. Now you'll be able to feel your eyes converging if you slowly bring a finger closer to your nose while focusing on it. When you close one eye, you no longer feel the tension. Convergence is a binocular depth cue that requires both eyes to work together. The visual system also uses accommodation to help determine depth. As the lens changes its curvature to focus on distant or close objects, information relayed from the muscles attached to the lens help us determine an object's distance. Accommodation is also effective in short viewing distance, however. So while it comes in handy when threading a needle or tying a shoe, it is far less effective when driving or playing sports. And although the best cues to depth occurs when both eyes are worked together, we are able to see depth when we close one eye. And there, because there are some monocular depth cues, and these are depth cues that help us perceive depth using only one eye. Now, there are some accuracies and inaccuracies in perception. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the skin, sense the world around us and in some cases perform preliminary information processing on the incoming data. But by and large we do not experience sensation. We experience the outcome of perception. The total package that the brain puts together from the pieces it receives through our senses and that the brain creates for us to experience. When we look out the window at a view of the countryside or we look at the face of a good friend, we don't just see a jumble of colors and shapes. We see instead an image of the countryside or an image of a friend. Now this perceptual system really helps interpret the environment. It's a meaning-making system that involves the automatic operation of a variety of essential perceptual processes. And one of these is sensory interaction, the working together of different senses to create an experience. Sensory interaction is involved when taste, smell, and texture combine to create the flavor we experience in food. It is also involved when we enjoy a movie because of the way the images and the music work together. Although you might think that we understand speech only through our sense of hearing, it turns out that the visual aspect of speech is also very important. And one example of sensory interaction is shown in the McGurk effect. Now the McGurk effect is an error in sound perception that occurs when there is a mismatch between the senses of hearing and seeing. 
And there is also an important perceptual process in selective attention that can take place. And this is the ability to focus on some sensory inputs while tuning out other sensory inputs. There can also be issues with selective attention. Selective attention also allows us to focus on a single talker at a party while ignoring other conversations that occur around us. Without this automatic selective attention, we'd be unable to focus on the single conversation we want to hear. But selective attention is not complete. We also at the same time monitor what's happening in the channels we are not focusing on. Perhaps you've had the experience of being at a party and talking to someone in one part of the room when suddenly you hear your name being mentioned by someone else in another part of the room. And this cocktail party phenomenon shows us that, the, that although selective attention is limiting what we process, we are nevertheless at the same time doing a lot of unconscious monitoring of the world around us. You didn't know that you were attending to the background sounds of the party, but evidently you were. There's also a second fundamental process of perception and that is sensory adaptation, that is a decreased sensitivity to a stimulus after prolonged and constant exposure. If you've ever stepped into a lake or a swimming pool that was initially felt cold, after a while you stop noticing it. After a prolonged exposure to the same stimulus, our sensitivity toward it diminishes and we are no longer able to perceive it. And the ability to adapt to the things that don't change around us is essential to our survival, as it leaves our sensory receptors free to detect the important and informative changes in the environment and to respond accordingly. We ignore sounds that our car makes every day. That leaves us free to pay attention to the sounds that are different from normal and thus likely need our attention. Our Sensory receptors are alert to novelty and fatigued by constant exposure to the same stimulus. And let's just end off with some illusions. So although our perception is very accurate, it isn't perfect. Illusions occur when the perceptual processes that normally help us correctly perceive the world around us are fooled by a particular situation so that we see something that doesn't really exist or that is incorrect. So for example, let's take a look at the picture here. Um, this picture presents two situations in which our normal accurate perceptions of visual constancy have been fooled. Now, if you look carefully at the snake-like pattern, are the green strips really brighter than the background? Now, if you cover the white curves, you'll see that they are not. Square A uh, in the right-hand image looks very different from square B, even though they are exactly the same. Another well-known illusion is the Mueller liar illusion. And the line segment in the bottom arrow looks longer to us than the one on top, even though they are both actually the same length. And it's likely that the illusion is, in part, the result of the failure of monocular depth cues. The bottom line looks like an edge that is normally farther away from us, whereas the top one looks like an edge that is normally closer. And the Mueller liar illusion makes the line segment at the top of the picture appear shorter than the one at the bottom. And the illusion is caused in part by this monocular gilly distance cue of depth. And we will stop there for this class. You take care. Bye-bye.